It's the Teching 101 Sword Showcase. One sword, two sword, three sword, four, five sword, six sword, seven sword more. I have, I have way more swords. Seven sword style, bring it on, Zoro, I can take you. Okay, okay, all right, all right, all right, all right, just gonna, all right, just gonna set those down and um, clean those up later. Hey everybody, how you doing? Teching here. It's, uh, it's been quite a while. Feels like forever since the last time we did a One Piece review. And don't worry about it, if you felt like that was a long break, there's another one after this. <laughs> Yay! Okay, so, um, but this week is pretty good. This week is a good chapter. This will be One Piece chapter 979 titled, A Family Problem. Uh, I know where this is going. You know, Kaido rules over the Beast Pirates. He's got Big Mom there. There's uh, not really a wedding. It's uh, a fire festival, kind of like a, a mingling kind of thing, you know, between Orochi Samurai and everybody in Wano and the Beast Pirates. But um, yeah, it's going to be kind of like in The Godfather. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think that's where this is going. Beiji's going to get involved. Actually, in Beiji's cover story, this week, oh my family, we don't get much from Beiji, but we do get something else. <laughs> so, um, do you guys remember Pound? <laughs> yeah, uh, he's alive. All right, like, 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 listen, that's par for the course at this point. You could see it coming, like, all right, Pound was a relatively minor character, and we didn't actually see, like, his head roll off the pier into the ocean. So, I mean, given Oda's track record with this, you could say, yeah, he's probably gonna be alive. I mean, when Oda wants to show us killing, like, like someone actually dying, like, he actually shows it, like, Odin getting shot in the face, okay? Up until when he actually showed that, there were a lot of people that, including me they're like all right he's probably gonna die at the end of this because it's all you know one piece flashback and all but until we actually see it like the bullet penetrating his head and then squirting raspberry jam all over the backdrop until we get to see that you know it's kind of up in the air so last time we saw pound uh was on uh cacao island when uh chiffon and everybody they were there and they were leaving and pound never really got a chance to like properly meet and introduce himself like i'm your dad you know and all that stuff so he just kind of like he held off oven as best as he could and then beiji's ship and they were sailing away from cacao island and pound was just kind of there and he was able to see her for one last time uh if at a distance you know not close up but he just kind of like stood on the shore and he's like well i've done the best i could do as a dad oh. Guess I gotta go to my big bakery in the sky now. And he kind of like just straightens his tie up because he knows Oven is right behind him and Oven is pissed. And Oven takes his giant like Naganata, like his polearm bladed weapon, heats it up with his Netsu Netsu Nome, and he's just like, Rrr! and he just like goes up behind him and Pound doesn't even look at him. He's like, I know what's gonna happen. And then we see like the splurt of blood and that's it. Um, so here in the cover story, uh, we actually see the Tontata Corps, their, uh, their ship, you know, that uh, the uh, members of the people of Dressrosa made for them, that little tiny pirate ship. It's like a galleon to the Tontatas. It has a figurehead shaped like uh, Usoland, of course. Uh, God Usoland. And so they're basically patrolling the island. I'm, I'm assuming this is way after Reverie too, because Leo and everybody went with the Dress Rosa's ship um, and the King Prodence and their, their ship over to Reverie. So I'm assuming this is after Reverie and everything's taken care of. I mention that because the whole thing with Beiji's cover story, it was kind of like up in the air exactly when it was taking place. Is this taking place in between like, you know, Tautland and Reverie? Uh, because we saw Reverie beginning to occur or like the murmurings of Reverie occurring. So we didn't exactly know when this is happening. But yeah, this is, I guess, after all that's over because the ship is here in Dress Rosa now, just patrolling the waters outside Greenbit. And um, there's a, uh, a Tot ship a tart ship, I guess, not a tart ship, a tart ship, and the tart ship is just kind of floating in the water, looks heavily battered and damaged, like it's been out to sea for a very long time, and we see a large man, Pound, just kind of like over the side of it, like, like honestly passed out, but maybe he's, and maybe he actually is dead, who knows, maybe after, like, Oven, like, sliced his back and he got severe burns, he's like, oh, and then everything else happened with Luffy, you know, jumping out of the mirror and distracted everybody long enough, maybe Pound was able to, like, regain consciousness and crawl away, and then get in a tart ship, um, and then sail away from Totland without a single person noticing, and then, uh, managed to drift directly to Dressrosa, which also just happens to be the location where Lola and Chiffon happen to be at this one particular moment in the story.
Okay, honestly, I'll tell you straight up, and then we'll get to the actual chapter. Like, okay, I could buy Pound getting away from Totland because of all the other nonsense that was going on. And remember, Praline disabled the sea slugs. And, and even Beiji himself managed to escape because everybody was focused on the straw hats and the germa. I can buy that. But the fact he happened to drift, what seems like just by happen chance, by accident, like he wasn't actually trying to come and just, his ship got really damaged in a storm and just happened to wash close to Dressrosa. That's the most unbelievable part here for me. The fact that Pound's still alive, I mean, I would have preferred he stay dead, you know, because, you know, that's emotion and everything there, and he's like, oh, I'm the dad, and I, I care about my kids, and I'm gonna give up my life, and then he's still alive here, but hey, everyone's gonna get a happy ending in this story, so, with the, with the cover story, anyway, so good for them. Anyway, moving on, we, uh, have a little bit of, uh, just, like, an overview of what's going on right now. Okay, so first we see Orochi getting drunk off his ass at Onigashima, and he's like, ha ha ha, I am Lord Orochi, whoa, this sake is really hitting me hard. Uh, I'm pretty awesome, aren't I? Let me review my previous schemes. So he just kind of goes in and talking about how he's just like, ha ha ha, yes, I have Kondro, my loyal servant turned traitor. Everyone thought he was their friend, but he was actually passing me information the whole time. We get to see quite literally Kondro's little birdies, you know, bringing him letters over the years. I, I, I'm even I'm assuming after they returned from the past, after they got into the future, those little birds that were tweeting around, some of them, maybe not all of them, but some of them were in fact Conjuro's birds and he sent a letter to Orochi like, hey Orochi, uh, apparently time travel's real and we're in the future. How you been? Um, so yeah, that's the thing. That's how he's been getting information back and forth and Orochi's like, ha ha ha, I sent the ships to destroy their ships and I blew up the bridges and I also sent those mighty galleons to destroy their feeble uh, attempt at a rebellion. They're all sleeping with the fishes right now. Glug, glug, glug. I'm so awesome. I am Lord Orochi. So that's, that's Lord Orochi right now and he finally thinks like he's thinking to himself it's like the outer monologue narrator's kind of doing this but i'm imagining orochi in his head is like finally finally i'll be able to sleep at night because you figure for the last 20 years orochi has probably not had a good night's sleep like i don't know what the equivalent of like nyquil would be in the one piece world he has some magic plant you chew on i don't know what it is but there's something he had to been doing because you know the last 20 years he's just like huh? he wakes up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat probably many times a week and just like ah odin ah zombie odin like clawing on his bed like Orochi will be back someday then he wakes up oh no no Odin get away from me <laughs> but now he's finally thinking this is gonna be it it's all over I waited those 20 years in fear but now I boom smash the rebellion into a thousand pieces we are set However, unbeknownst to Orochi, the rebellion is still going on. So now we cut outside to Muffin Mountain, and we see kind of everybody, you know, going their own separate ways, beginning the plan, okay? So we have Kinemon and Denjiro. Um, they're actually going to split up and kind of follow the route of the original plan. The original plan was we're going to flank around Muffin Mountain. One force goes to the, you know, one side of the mountain and the other side of the other, and we're going to kind of rendezvous in the back, because at the back of Muffin Mountain, that's where Kaido's, like, mansion is. That's where the fire Festival is actually going on. That's why, that's where Queen's, you know, getting bumping, you know, that's where everything's going out. Okay. So, Kinemon is commanding the Eastern forces. Denjiro is commanding the Southern. Also, alongside Denjiro, you also have Hyo and a few of the other Yakuza, and then you have, like, Sicilian with Kinemon, and you got, uh, oh, Jubeamon with, uh, Kinemon. Jubeamon was the guy, was, like, the first person that actually went, and, like, after the, um, the scabbards arrived in the future, he was the first person that was like, we knew you would come! So, we see him there, too. I, I could kind of, like, nip pick over the directions here because like let's uh let's pull up the little map of Wano we have here all right so this is the map of Wano that we were originally introduced to we know that Ringo and Hakumai are in like a more northern area of the country because it snows there and also Ringo has the northern graveyard so I would assume that's in the north so it's more like this is the actual north south west east kind of thing and so Onigashima is over here but that would also mean that Muffin Mountain I just assume Muffin Mountain was like you know directly facing this way so they just land on the island from this direction they just like muffin mountains right there but uh no i guess it turns out muffin mountains turned slightly for there to be like one side being the eastern side and one side being the southern side i'm not really sure how that particularly works but i'm not i'm not gonna go into more detail when i start nitpicking cardinal directions in one piece that is a rabbit hole we're not coming out of okay and did you see how carrot is dressed in this chapter yeah we're gonna have hard enough time getting out okay i'm not even gonna continue that joke let's go 
on, let's go on. All right, all right. So now we see Law's submarine, all right? Uh, last time, I didn't know if Ino Arashi was in there, uh, but we do see him there now. We see uh, all of the scabbards. We see um, Ashura Doji, Ino Arashi, Kawamatsu, and Raizo, and Kiku, as well as uh, the Heart Pirate crew, you know? So we see Beppo, and Sachi, and Penguin, and Law in the submarine, and they're going all the way around, basically taking the cheat code. They're going all the way around the island, and then Law's gonna use his op-op fruit to just teleport them on the shore, so they're gonna do that. But Denjiro and Kinemon have to command their individual forces to let them know, like, oh, okay, this is their main force. They're not gonna expect, you know, more in the back, okay? So that's the main issue right there. And then, of course, we have the Straw Hats that, um, for lack of a better term, they're they're kind of just given their own free reign to do whatever, uh, you know, because Kanemon trusts them, everybody, like, the, the Scabbards trust them and everything like that, uh, but we get a little bit more with the Straw Hats later. First off, we touch base with Kondro and Momo. All right, so what was the deal with them? All right, because they get to the um, the inner bay of Onigashima, and Kanemon's looking around, and it's like, wow, there's, like, nobody here to stop us. Maybe Kondro didn't get back to Orochi yet? Like, what? Huh? I even read a spoiler for this chapter, like, before the official ones came out, because the spoiler's came out for this actually really, really early because it was a golden week in Japan, but the uh, the trade-off for that is some of the spoilers weren't very accurate, and there was a spoiler that said that the reason Kondro wasn't at Onigashima was because he went to go target Hiori next. He's like, ah, I have Momo, then I'll get Hiori, and I'll, then I'll report to Orochi, which that line of reasoning actually kind of made sense to me. Still, you'd think that Kondro would send a letter, hey, by the way, Orochi, I did capture Momo, uh, by the way, the rebellion's still happening, so keep that in mind. I'm gonna go get Hi Hiori and bring it back for like a, a banquet present. All right, be right back, buddy. Um, but no, Kondro, he didn't, he, that has nothing to do with anything yet. That was just a fake spoiler, but I felt like it should be mentioned because Hiori is probably going to be involved here at some point. I'm just not really sure how. But anyway, he's uh, basically lost in Onigashima, Kondro is. He he gets on the epic crane, he sails away with Momo, they land on the island, and they're just wandering around the, the caverns of Muffin Mountain, I guess, around Kaido's base. And like, did they land on the top of the mountain and like, all right, let's go, Momo. But Kondro has never been here before, all right, because he's always been secretly sending messages back and forth between Orochi just with his devil fruit power. They've never actually met because that would kind of like that, that would cause some problems if anyone sees them meet and, you know, to keep it distant as much as possible to let it believe that Kondro is truly a member of the Scabbards through and through. So even the other members of the Beast Pirates, the random guards that are stationed there, they still think that Kondro is an enemy. They still think he's a member of the Nine Red Scabbards. So they attack him and Kondro has to beat them all down. He's like, oh man, this is annoying. I'm lost. I have no idea where I am. Man, this was not a very well thought out plan. Hey, here's a question, Kondro, and I'm honestly legitimately curious about this because we even see this early in the chapter. Um, why doesn't Kondro just do the same thing he's been doing and sending letters to Orochi? Make a little bird, and he's been clearly able to pass letters back and forth. The only thing I get is maybe before Orochi, they, he knew exactly where he was. Orochi was in his throne room in the palace in the flower capital. So you could send letters to him because you know exactly where it is. But at this one particular instance, Orochi is not in the flower capital. He's in Kaido's palace, and he's never been in Kaido's palace, so I guess he wouldn't know how to send the letters. But still, you'd think there'd be another way to contact him in this particular instance. you think Orochi would have, like, uh, sent somebody to, like, secretly give him one of those uh, pawn snails and just be like, hey, 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 here, take this. When you get everything ready, uh, contact Lord Orochi. Here you go. Like, there's probably a few people like the Oni Wabanshu or the Mimawaragumi that are aware of this whole thing. Orochi's very paranoid, so he would not tell the whole thing with Kondro being the traitor to everyone. Um, Kaido certainly knows about it. We know that much. But I'm sure there's other a few, like, elite members in Orochi's entourage that know about Kondro. So you'd think at some point he would send one of the Oni Wabanshu to, like, hey, he's like, uh, yeah, when you get everything ready, uh, contact Orochi here. Or here's a, here's a smell. We've had these the last 20 years. Use them to contact. Something like that, I would assume, but it's just it just seems like really kind of just like, all right, well, I got to report back to Orochi immediately to alert him of the uh, rebellion. Crap, I don't know where to go, and I don't have GPS. What am I going to do? So he's just lost in a tunnel beating people up. Momo is there, and Momo is just kind of being quiet and just kind of like following Kondro, just kind of trying to think of a plan. He's not like crying and bawling anymore. I think he got over that phase, and he's like, okay, all right, here we go. This is like, this is a big moment for Momo. It really is. This is like, I mean, yeah, he got captured at like Punk Hazard and everything like that. Not really captured. Uh, he did, but then he got locked in a trash compactor or whatever. But this is like a really major moment for Momo where he's chained up with essentially a knife at his throat and just been like, you're coming with me. And Momo's like, all right, I am, 
I am the son of Odin Kozuki. I am the heir to the Wano Shogunate. I, I, I gotta, I gotta do this. I gotta make sure I can survive. And so he looks down and he sees one of the uh, the daggers that one of the guards dropped when Kondro beat the crap out of them. Kondro's like, ah oh, man, look how many tunnels are in this damn place. And one, two. All right, oh, hold on a sec. Momo, don't move. I'm just gonna like any mini mining mo. I'm a traitor to the. So, I don't know how to rhyme. I'm not a very good linguist. All right, I guess we're going this way. Come on, Momo, you know? And uh, anyway, Momo picks up the knife, and he's like, he doesn't really pick it up, but he eyes it. He's like, hmm. In the background, you can hear Queen singing, so that kind of adds a little bit of a dist uh, distraction to it. So they're like in the tunnel, and they just hear like, boom, 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 boom. And, you know, Momo's just like, okay, I'm just going to take this dagger. So we're going to see where that's going to go from later. Um, actually, yeah, Conjuro just has him wrapped up in a rope, not a chain or anything like that. So in theory, he could just use that dagger to, like, cut himself free. He has to be very careful with how he do does it, obviously, because Conjuro's right there. But maybe if they leave him alone for a little bit, maybe uh, Momo can just you know, cut out the rope and manage to get away. That'd be pretty neat. All right, so now uh, we see the brief scene of the flower festival. Everyone's like cheering and getting drunk and having a good time. Uh, now we cut over to see what the Straw Hats are up to. And like I said, the Straw Hats basically have free reign to like, all right, you guys, you're a small group in general. You're only like 10 strong. So you guys go wherever you want. You do your own thing. Um, we have Frankie busting out the uh, FRU4 motorcycle. We don't get to see this thing and the Brachio tank. We don't get to see these as much as we should. Cause usually Frankie just busts out, you know, now, it's the same thing, the same problem you had with Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and all of the Power Rangers seasons, to be honest with you. You have the individual Zords that I thought looked really cool, but half the time they don't even use the individual Zords. Half the time it's just like, call Zords, Mega Zord, boom, done. That's what happens, right? A lot of times watching Power Rangers, I was like, come on, guys, you have like individual Zords. In fact, you could even argue that, you know, a five versus one would be a lot more efficient in all this. You know, like Rita Repulsa's like, make a giant monster okay here we go all right well it has to be a one-on-one -on -one fight i'm like no you have like like use the tyrannosaurus rex and use like the triceratops to knock him off his feet and the ter pterodactyl can like launch attacks from the air like do that kind of stuff that'd be cool that's usually what frankie does he just breaks out the motorcycle and the tank combines them together to make the iron pirate frankie shogun but here we see them individually frankie's of course riding on the motorcycle and of course commander chopper is in command of the brachio tank five yeah, okay, we're just making Chopper, like, uh, all right, all right, Chopper, you are now a uh, commander in the Marines, buddy. We're doing this, all right, you're now a tank commander. That's just a thing. All right, let the small reindeer kid drive the giant tank. Actually, he's not the one driving it, but he's the commanding officer, of course. So he breaks those things out. Um, in fact, Jean Bay even says, like, hey, I remember those things from our battle on Fishman Island. And Frankie's like, Jean Bay, they're not things. They're super mechanical wonders. You know, that's what they truly are. All right. So the way this is all going to shake down, we got Usopp, Carrot, Nami, Shinobu, and Chopper all inside of the Brachio Tank 5. With Usopp, of course, being the one to drive it and the one to fire off the mortars when they ne when are necessary because he's the marksman. Sanji is like, oh, let me ride too. And he like looks inside and it's just like Usopp surrounded by hot women and Chopper. And, uh, you know, Sanji's like, oh, no, come on, come on, Usopp, let me drive the tank for a change. And Usopp, I mean... He's honestly not trying to be funny. He's just like, I'm sure he's enjoying this, but he's also just like, Sanji, you couldn't drive this thing better than I could. He's like, ah, well, okay, yeah, you do have a point. Could you fire this, like, giant tank mortar more accurately than I could either? It's like, well, I could try. All right, I guess you're riding up top, buddy. And so Sanji's just stuck outside riding on top of the tank. Just like, crap, this sucks. Meanwhile, inside... Look, I'm just saying it's a tank, and they're not exactly riding on, you know, nice paved roads. So, um, in that tank right now, you literally have Usopp with Chopper on his head, like, poking his head out of the hatch and being like, Commander Chopper! So he's, like, you know, commanding around. But then you got, like, Carrot on one side, Nami on the other, and it's... It's gonna get jiggly up in that tank. And then Shinobu as well. It's gonna get jiggly up in that tank. Usopp, you gotta... I mean, honestly, if this was Sanji, he would be passed out within the first two seconds. So it's probably good that Usopp's in there. But you gotta maintain some control, Usopp, all right? Because when the heat gets on, you can't be distracted. It's like riding in the tank and just... Oh, there's an enemy! There's an all-star! There's Jack! Load the tank! Up. Boing, 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 boing. Duh! 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 Okay, I'm just gonna... I'm just gonna sense it! Observation hockey! Boom! 
<laughs> you know, um, yeah, that's 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 a legitimate thing that could happen. All right. So anyway, then you got Frankie busting out his hog, his chopper, and he just like, and he goes up to uh, Brooke and Robin and Jean Bay, and he's like, hey. There's room and there's a seat in the back if someone wants to come with me. And then he's actually saying it to Robin, but instead Brooke is the one like, yo ho ho ho, oh that's so nice of you, let's go. And then before he even he gets to realize what it is, like uh, Brooke just jumps on the back of the FRU4 and just like, let's go. And Frankie's like, hey, come on, I was, I was requesting the seat for the lady. And Brooke's like, well, male bonding is good too. Yo ho ho ho. Okay, Brooke, listen man, I love you to death. Skull jokes are all funny. Fun, fun and games, whatever. Okay, great. Um, 45 degrees! Okay, that's cool. Um, you screwed me out of my, one of my prime ships in this story. You, you screwed me out of the Frankie Robin ships, so I'm not really feeling you right now, buddy. I'm all right, I'm okay, but uh, you're, you're kind of blocking my man Frankie here, and I'm not really enjoying that, all right? Okay, I'm just saying right now, Brooke, you better do some really cool stuff in this arc. I am actually looking forward to Frankie and Brooke fighting together, because you don't get to see that very often, you know? I think Oda's taking advantage of that. He's like, okay, the Straw Hats have not been all together in, like, ever. So, I mean, Frankie and Brooke really haven't had a good chance to, like, fight together, so let's let's throw that in there. Okay, cool. Which, of course, just leaves uh, Robin and Jinbei left behind. And, uh, oh, by the way, yeah, we do get to see Jinbei and Frankie, and more importantly, Robin's beast pirate outfit here. It's the single sexiest, most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my... All right, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. That was, um, everybody has uh, their list, you know, the list of things they want to accomplish and see in life. You know, I thought there'd be more stuff on here, but honestly, I think I've seen it all now. I mean, I, I had, like, world travel on here, and, uh, you know, learn Japanese fluently and, you know, do all that stuff. Maybe even go into space, maybe in my later years. I don't know how this is going to work, but that's all out the window now. I've seen Robin in a Beast Pirate outfit. I'm set. I'm good. Age 27, I've seen it all at this point. Yep, I'm happy. All right, so, but no, she looks absolutely gorgeous, of course. I love how it's just like, all right, well, we're going to give you these outfits for the Beast Pirates so you'll blend right in and just whoosh. Uh, it, it's like basically bondage gear and Robin is just like, I get like Nami because she always kind of wears more revealing outfits, but Robin not so much. Robin's just, I can deal with this. I'm like, okay, yes, yeah, that's nice. Anyway, so um, it's just Robin and Jinbei and Sanji's like, they're riding away on the tank and there's like, hey, Robin, you want to ride on top of the tank with me? <laughs> Maybe I can still salvage something out of this. And Robin's just like, oh no, no, it's Sanji Kun. It's okay. It's it's going to get so dusty on there. It's, it's I'm just going to walk with Jinbei. And Sanji's like, okay. And then the tank just drives away with Sanji on top of it. Just okay. And then, um, anyway, so then you got Jinbei and Robin hanging out, and that's actually a real, where'd my clicker go? There it is. And then you got uh, Jinbei and, and uh, Robin hanging out, and it's a really cool moment. By the way, uh, Jinbei with just the strap and everything, he's still got the very obvious sun pirate tattoo right on his chest, so I don't think this is really going to fool anybody for that long, but you know, maybe if you just catch it at a glimpse of your eye, you wouldn't think it's like a, an enemy, right? Well, anyway, um... You know, Jinbei is like, he's like, well, you know, the key factor to this war, you know, it's all well and good that we have all these energized people. We got a tank, we got a giant motorcycle, you know, and all that stuff. But it's, it's, it's important to stay calm in this battle. The ones that stay calm and, you know, just ease everything out, those are the ones that are going to succeed here. And Robin is just like... Oh my god, there's another person on this crew that is actually, you know, intelligent and mature in their thinking of how this is going to... This is going to be the start of a great friendship, Jean Bay. I welcome you to our crew wholeheartedly. I love that, because I'm not saying all the other members of the Straw Hats, they're not smart. They are. It's just that a lot of times, it's just like, charge in and fight! You know, disregard all plans whatsoever and just hit them really hard! You know, and so Jean Bay is like, you know, the crucial key to this battle is going to be tactical things and trying to come up with a good plan to really get Kaido and Orochi off guard. And Robin's just like, Oh my god, 
That actually makes so much sense. It's not just me saying this stuff anymore. Nami says it too, but it's just like, this is nice. So uh, they begin to walk away, and then I don't know where exactly they're heading, although in the distance behind them as they're walking away, we get to see some rustling in the leaves in the undergrove, just kind of like, shh, mysterious individual watching them as they walk away, probably very much aware that they're not beast pirates and they're actually the enemy. So um, yeah, so we got Frankie and Brooke on the FRU-4, and then we got pretty much everybody else inside of the tank. Uh, then we got uh, Jean Bay and Robin just going on a nice leisurely stroll around Onigashima. But what about Luffy and Zoro? Well, that's the fun part. All right, I want you guys to be with, uh, just bear with me on this, all right? Luffy. Monkey D. Luffy. He's going to be king of the pirates. I don't know if you've heard. He had a moment, it doesn't happen very often with Luffy, but he had a moment where he's like, they're all gearing up for the battle, they're all getting ready to go, they're all breaking off into their different divisions, Kinemon, Denjiro, they're all going separate ways. And then Luffy, just like a stray thought, just entered his head as just like, Kid, you know, you know, Jaggy, let's just call him Jaggy Head or whatever, he's like, Kid doesn't know our plan. He's gonna ruin everything. I better go stop him. That is so damn funny. And then everyone in the crew is just like, you're the one that's going to screw everything up, Luffy. Just charging it, and he's off. And then Zoro's like, ah, no, 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 no. It's okay, guys. It's okay. You see, I better go after him, or he's going to get lost. And everyone's like, what? No! But it's like, at a point with the crew, it's like, you can't really stop him. You know, like, if Zoro's going to be like, I'll go after him in case he gets lost. Everybody knows what's going to happen, but it's like... We can't stop him, and then he's because he's already gone, right? So that, I find that hilarious. Like Luffy's, like he, Luffy at this point, he he starts to actually think about the battle itself, and like that stray thought just enters his head of just like, wait a second, yeah, he's gonna ruin everything because he doesn't know, you know, uh, laws and Kinemon's plan. I better go stop him and give him bring bring him up to speed. What's Luffy? I, I would love that moment, by the way. I would love to see Luffy catch up with Kid and be like, hey, hey, Jaggy Head, you don't understand the plan. He's like, what are you talking about? The plan is to... Well, the original... Well, Kinemon told... Shit, what did, what did they want us to do? Oh, yeah, we were supposed to just uh, beat Kaido. That's what we're supposed to do, beat Kaido. We're supposed to go in and beat Kaido. Now, come on. You know, because, like, even Luffy probably wouldn't remember the plan when they finally catch up to him. And then Zoro, of course. Oh, my God. Okay, so play, place your bets what's going to happen to Zoro, because he is not going to catch up with Luffy. He's going to get completely lost somewhere in Onigashima, and he's going to end up stumbling upon, like, Kaido's son hiding behind a box or something. Like, it's going to happen, right? Or he's going to bump into Kondro, also lost, and just going to be the this weird moment where like Zoro runs into Kondro in the tunnel and just like sees Momo there and like huh all right and then, you know it, it, it place your bets or he's gonna end up somehow like back on Wano mainland I don't know how that would even happen he gets lost in a tunnel and like the tunnel connects Onigashima with the mainland and he pops out in the Hakumai region like oh huh I didn't know Kaido's manor had so many, like, trees inside of it. That's weird. All right, and he just continued. Something weird's going to happen with Zoro. Just pay attention to that, of course. Now, we come to the last scene of the chapter, which is the most interesting part of the chapter. We have the uh, gathering of the Tobiropo before Kaido. All right, and this is actually a pretty cool moment because you see all the Tobiropo standing up there. We also get, like, a basic height for Black Maria. Uh, so Black Maria, she, we see Jack and King are both in the room as well, and Black Maria is even taller than King. Now, we do not know how tall King is, but we know he's about comparable in size to the other Calamities, so Jack and Queen. We also don't know Queen's height, but we do know Jack's. Jack is 8.3 meters tall, so he's getting up to like Big Mom levels. Big Mom's 8.8, .8, so he's still shorter than Big Mom, but not by much, okay? And so if we're going to go along the logic that King and Queen and Jack, they're all roughly the same height, might be a bit different, you know, maybe a little taller, a little shorter. Uh, Black Maria here, she is... Um, easily, like, like, King's head comes up to, like, her mid-chest area, or er, breast area, if we're just being straight up, if I'm just looking at this correctly. So, yeah, probably not a full-fledged giant, because she's not 12 meters. I mean, she might be 12 meters, so that's, like, the bare, bare minimum, but even that, I don't think. She might be, like, a half-giant or something, although she's not a mermaid, because we could see her legs. Uh, maybe, she, well, she could be a mermaid that's just over the age of 30, because we've seen mermaids get that big, but I'm assuming maybe, like, half-giant, or maybe, like, a distant relative to, like, the ancient giant race, something like that, but she's certainly tall 
taller than King, Jack, Queen, and Big Mom even. So yeah, there's that with that. Okay, so um, they're all getting gathered together. Of course, we, we were originally led to believe by Kaido. Kaido was like, I'm having a family problem. Assemble the Toby Ropo. Glug, glug, glug. Turns out that's not actually the case, although they are all getting together, and it is really cool because, like, Sasaki's like, you know, hey, Kaido man, how, how's it been? I want to have a drink with you. I'm tired of drinking with these scrubs. I want to drink with you, man. And Kaido's like, yeah, damn straight, Sasaki. Meet me in the hall later. We'll tie one on. Should be fun. Glug, glug, glug. But enough with the pleasantries. All right, let's just, guys, this is a day where we just kind of all mingle. I wanted you all to meet Lin Lin, but she's still getting changed, so we'll worry about that later. Um, but uh, I know you've been waiting here a while, but the thing is, I haven't even summoned you. I wasn't even the one that did that. Um, Ulti, by the way, is there, and Ulti's like switching back and forth between her personality again, so she's very random. At first, she's like, Kaido-sama, oh my god, I missed you so much! And then Kaido's like, I know I kept you guys waiting for a while. And Ulti's like, ah, yeah, I know, what's with this? Come on, I have stuff to do today. And, and there was like, what? Shut up. But Kaido doesn't really get upset at her. She, he really doesn't. He's just like, oh, I'm sorry about that. But yeah, um, who summoned you? Because I didn't do it. And then King steps up and King's like, I did, Lord Kaido. I summoned them. And I know that they wouldn't come if I, you know, if I summoned them myself. Like, you know, King has issued you a summons. You know, Sasaki and Husu in particular, I know you guys wouldn't show up. And they're like, yeah, we probably would have just blown it off. Screw you, buddy. Like, uh-huh, yeah. So that's why I lied and said that you summoned them, okay? Because otherwise you couldn't get them all together. And the reason I did that, King is explaining, the reason I did that was because I overheard you were having an issue with your child, your son. And so I figured the Toby Ropo might be able to help out in that situation. And King and uh, Kaido was just like, yeah, you're right about that. Look, look, look. So he doesn't really get mad at King for, like, lying and everything. But it does go to, you know, explain exactly the situation between the Toby Ropo and the Calamities. It's, um, it's explained that how you get a higher rank in the crew is just through skill. All right, so it's not really that difficult. It's pretty straightforward in the Beast Pirates. I mean, you show your worth, you show that you're really strong, and then you could defeat the enemies, and you're really powerful. Then you go through the ranks. Let's say you get a you get a smile, you become a gifter, and then you wipe out a marine battleship. It's like, all right, well, you'll be a headliner now. And it's like, oh, you wiped out some marine, an entire marine base. Let's say that's pretty cool. You're really strong. You're really capable. We'll make you a Toby Robo next, and you just keep going up through the crew. Until until you get to the Calamity class, which is like the highest outside of Kaido himself. Um, but you can't just challenge a Calamity whenever. You can't just be like, you know, walking down the hallway, like who's who's walking down the hallway? Who's walking down the hallway? Who's who's walking down the hallway? And then he runs into King and is like, King, I'm gonna fight you! Shing, shing! You can't do that. Yeah, if they defeat one of the Calamities, they themselves, the Toby Ropa, will be elevated to the, you know, position of Calamities. But it's like, uh, Kaido has to sanction the fight first. You can't just be like, whenever, you know, because that's gonna cause some problems. Just, it would be nothing but infighting constantly if that was the situation. It's not that brutal. So Kaido kind of proposes to them a challenge. He kind of says to them, he's like, all right, here's the deal. I have a mission for all you Toby Ropo. If you could go and find and bring back my idiot son Yamato that disappeared this morning, then I will give you the right to challenge one of my calamities. Take your pick, King, Queen, or Jack. I'm thinking a lot of you might choose Jack. No offense, Jack. It's all right, Kaido-sama, I know. He's like, yeah. Anyway, you can challenge any calamity of your choice, and if you win in a fair fight, well, maybe fair fight's kind of stretching it. If you win in a fight, then you will become the next calamity. And the Toby Ropo, especially Sasaki and Huzu, you can tell they're, they're, they're the ones that are vying for this spot more than the others. I'm sure Ulti, Black Maria, x -Drake has his own motives here with Sword and everything. Um, and uh, Page One, they might have their own goals and ambitions, but you can tell Sasaki and pa and Huzu are the ones that have been here for a while, and they're like, oh yeah, we want that position. Because they don't respect King or Queen or Jack at all. They're just like, yeah, they're they're, they're, they're the, the upper echelon of management, but that doesn't mean I have to take orders from them. Screw them. I want their position. I'd be a better calamity than any of them. You know, like, look at what happened to Jack. You know, he got beat up by a freaking elephant. He was on the bottom of the ocean. We had to save his ass. We deserve to have that position. Look at Queen dancing around like a freaking idiot, singing about Funky. I could be a better calamity than him. So they really don't respect them at all. And so Kaido proposes this challenge. and like, bring back my son, Yamato, uh, and then you can get the challenge, the right to be a calamity. Any, any uh, arguments from you guys? Now, Queen is obviously not there. Queen is still out singing in front of the crowd and everything, but King and Jack are just like, nope, no complaints here. Yeah, that's how they go. So they seem pretty serious about this and everyone seems really in involved. Uh, who's who is kind of smirking like, oh yeah, yeah, this is my time to shine. We also find out here that all members of the Toby Ropo are former pirate captains. So these are pirates.
pirate captains for their entire crew that probably got defeated by Kaido at one point and basically were given the ultimatum. Like, you know, you can either die here or join my crew because you guys are pretty strong. That's how X Drake ended up joining. I mean, it's all part of an undercover operation for X Drake, but Drake was captain of the Drake Pirates, right? Of course. So, you know, who's who? Sasaki, everybody were all captains. I'm interested in uh, exactly what kind of captain. Uh, maybe Page One and Ulti were like the same crew because of the situation. Maybe they were like joint captains because they're brother or sister. I'd like to see Black Maria's crew, though. That would have been, that, that would actually be interesting. Maybe like a little oars kind of like giant based or ancient giant, giant descended crew would be kind of neat for Black Maria, right? Um, you know, but anyway. So, uh, and, and by the way, even maybe Black Maria is a giant. She's just the shortest of all giants. Maybe she's the standard. Maybe it's like, well, yeah, the shortest giant's only 12 meters. Maybe she is the only giant that's 12 meters, but she's still ridiculously strong. So it's like, size matters not. Mm -hmm. You know, something like that. Maybe. I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so that we find out about the Toby Ropo and their former pirate captains, and they're really, they, they're, they're ambitious is what they're doing, because at the end of the day, they were on top of the world. They were the boss of their own crew. Then Kaido showed up, and now they're just part of, like, middle management, essentially, with the Toby Ropo. You know each and every one of them is going to yearn for something more. They know. No, screw this. We don't want middle management. We want, we, we, can't, we can't be a Yonko. We want to be upper management. We want to be the right arms of the Yonko, and those are the calamities. Okay, so that's what they're vying for there. Now, more importantly, we get Kaido's son's name, Yamato. Now, interesting why it is Yamato. Uh, Yamato is an old school name for Japan, the country of Japan, or the government of Japan, okay? Uh, we're talking a long time ago, even before, like, like, because the Edo period is kind of the basis for Wano, and how everything is set up there, like feudal Japan. We're talking, like, I think Yamato period, there's other periods that are involved in the Yamato period, but it's, like, 200 AD to, like, 700 AD, so it's, like, 3rd to 8th century kind of ancient Japan kind of deal we're dealing with here, and, uh, in, uh, the Nara prefecture, that was kind of, like, the seat of power for the imperial court of Japan back in the day, and, uh, yeah, Yamato was basically the, the name of it, essentially, back then. You say the Yamato, the land of Yamato, and that was it, so it fits the whole, like, you know, um, ancient Japan phrases that we're doing with, uh, Wano and everything. It's just even further back than the Edo period, like by a thousand years, even more than that, a thousand years, uh, like like literally the third century AD. So that's pretty crazy, right? We don't get anything else about his son, though. I mean, it's still up in the air. None of that, like, if the Toby Ropo actually knew that, like, oh yeah, Kaido's son died years ago, and you know he's just lying to us, right? He's not lying to him, us, but lying to himself right now, or he forgot or something. They wouldn't say that right in front of him. They wouldn't say it. Although Ulti gets really upset, and Ulti's like, I knew it was a family problem. Solve this crap on your own. I'm like, shut up, shut up, shut up. But, you know, nobody really gets offended by it, so just continuing on, I guess. But now, and I understand I'm doing this a little bit of out of order, apologize, I'm trying to tackle all the major points first, but um, Kaido also summons another uh, headliner that we haven't met before named Bao Huang. And Bao Huang is a flying squirrel smile. Uh, she's wearing a mask. I'm assuming it's a girl. She's wearing a mask and she looks pretty young. So probably like, you know, probably not much older than like Tama or somebody. But she's a flying squirrel headliner. And she's kind of just like the one in charge, like Kaido's secretary kind of. And she's the one that's kind of in charge of like, here's the schedule of events for the fire Festival. Here's what we're doing today. Okay. So the first thing that's right now is going on is Queen is doing the Golden Festival. He's doing like the Funky Time Funk Fest 2020. Yeah. Yeah. So he's doing that. And then after him, you got the, the the three calamities. You got King, Queen, and Jack are all going to do, along with uh, Fuku Rokuju, the leader of the Oniwabanshu, are going to have a toast together. So that's the next event after this. Um, these are probably going to be important. So I would I would, I would would take notes. I would take notes. Now we're doing a schedule. I don't think Kaido was the kind of person to do, all right, guys. You know, he comes in like a couple weeks before the festival. He comes in. He's like, oh, I'm sorry. He's drinking coffee. I'm sorry, guys. It's such a busy day. All right. We need to work on the scheduling for this event. Okay. Because last year, you know, it was just uh, a complete mess. I, I need to really sit down. We need to plan this out. When are we going to do our toast? Because last year we held it for the end and I, everyone was tired and drunk and nobody really knew what was going on. Let's save that for the beginning now. Imagine Kaido sitting down with his headliners and everybody in the calamities and doing like festival planning events. Because when I was in college, I had to do that too for like this multicultural fair. And they're not the most exciting meetings in the world, but you got to attend them if you want a, you know, a tight ship for this festival. Okay, you got to make sure things are planned out, right? Okay then. So uh, after the toast, we we then have Orochi and Kaido coming out and giving a speech together. Uh, but then you got some special events because this year Big Mom is present. So then uh, Bao Huang, and by the way, Bao Huang I thought would be really like, oh, uh, like a Chinese name. That's cool. I wonder what it means. It's just a card game. 
as you would figure, everything else is a card game. I don't know why I thought it would be something else, but it's a, it's a card game, all right? So anyway, um, the next thing that's going to happen is the arrival of the Big Mom pirate ship. We will have Master Kaido and Big Mom together announcing to the entirety of Onigashima that the world's strongest pirate alliance has been formed. Now, couple of things about this. Big Mom's ship, what does she mean by that? Because Big Mom's main ship, the Queen Mama Shanter, that's already arrived in Wano, okay? And earlier, last chapter, we had Queen doing that big number, like, can I hear you waiters? Can I hear you pleasures? Can I hear you gifters? He also said, I also have Big Mom's children! Can I get a yeah? Now, everyone, we didn't see Big Mom's kids in the crowd, but we're assuming they are there. So, is Bao Huang talking about the Queen Mama Shanter arriving? Or is it another pirate ship that is bringing all the kids from Totland? Now, I don't think that's the case, because you, you'd be essentially leaving the entire archipelago unmanned at that point. So I'm not talking like every single kid, but what I'm basically getting across here is, is Katakuri going to be arriving at Wano? What about Pudding? What about Cracker? The ones that we haven't gotten to see yet. Uh, Amande. Is Amande there? I don't think Amande's there yet. Are they going to be arriving at, you know, Onigashima for this event? That's the question. Uh, it could just be the Big Mom, you know, kids, they went away from the festival, they got on the Queen Mama Shanter, and they're going to have, like, a big epic entrance. Like, they're going to enter when Big Mom enters. Like, finally, when Big Mom walks out in her kimono, then that's when the children walk out also to kind of, like, display the power of the Big Mom crew to Onigashima, like, walking out all at once. All right, so they might be doing that. But, you know, once again, if you're going to display the power of the Big Mom crew, it's probably best to get all of the sweet commanders together. So you already have Smoothie. They might have, they had time to send word back to Totland, it'd be like Katakuri, Cracker, I guess, you know, get on a ship and come out here. Maybe some other members of the crew as well. Uh, we might get to see Tamago again, you know, other members of the crew and uh, show back up and, and walk out to like really express our power. Because you think if they're going to announce like this is the birth of the greatest pirate alliance ever, you think you'd want the calamities and all the sweet commanders present when you make that announcement. Like this is the full power of these crews, right? And I just want to see Katakuri again. So that's, that's another thing too. But yeah. Uh, but even kind of more interesting beyond that, uh, Bao Hawang continues and she's like, okay, after that announcement for the Pirate Alliance, then Kaido himself will have a very important announcement, and that's all we have planned for today. And the Toby Ropo are like, oh, like Black Maria is like, oh, uh, an important announcement. That's unusual for you, Lord Kaido. You usually don't be that coy. Usually, if you if you have some, all right, listen up, persons, glug glug glug. Today we're gonna get drunk and get a lot of really nice food. All right, announcement's over. I'll continue. Glug. That's usually how Kaido does it. This time he's like, oh, special announcement from Kaido. What's that mean? Kaido has his own live action movie. That's probably what that means when I hear a beer. Like that, that was a flashback to Bleach for a second there. Next chapter of Bleach, a huge announcement right before it ends. Live action movie. Oh, all right, that's that's okay. I mean, if Kaido came out and says, I have a live action movie, glug, 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 and Dwayne The Rock Johnson's going to be playing me in the starring role. Oh, yeah. Okay, I would actually legitimately watch that. Who wouldn't? I mean, come on, that'd be pretty cool. But anyway, no. So Kaido is just like, yeah, yeah, I know, it's not really part of my character, but if I just announced it right now, or if I wrote it down on the form, like, this is the announcement, it's just going to cause confusion. So I, I, I want to announce this in person, in front of everybody. That's going to be the situation, all right? And then uh, we continue on with the thing I said earlier. Like I said, I kind of did this like uh, out of place. But then he gives them the mission for Yamato and everybody. And then the last scene of the chapter is we have Luffy arriving at the banquet hall. So, you know, he ran all the way through Onigashima and managed to get... So Luffy, say whatever you want about him. He at least has good sense of direction because he made it all the way to the freaking banquet hall. He's infiltrated Kaido's manor already. Like, Luffy's just right there. So he's in the middle of the banquet hall. Everyone's getting drunk. Everyone's, like, partying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kai and Luffy's, like, just jumping on their heads. And everyone's... Everyone's either drunk and also he's wearing the outfits. There's like, hey, don't I know you from somewhere? And Luffy's just like, no, probably not. Hey, do you know where Jaggy Head is? And I'm like, who the hell is Jaggy Head? Glug. Anyway, so then a random pot of Oshiruko red bean soup just gets dunked on Luffy's head. And he's like, what? And apparently what happened was they made too much Oshiruko. And Oshiruko is a very sweet dish, a sweet Japanese dish, like a soup. And so um, they brought some out for just the regular people to have. But there were some drunk idiots that were like, oh, 
all right, we can't drink this crap. It's too sweet. We can't drink this with sake. And they're like just kicking all the barrels of Oshiruko over and one landed on you know Luffy's head. And he's just like, oh God, it's getting everywhere. And the other members of the pirates, they're all like, you know, making fun of Okabore town. They're like, hey, I know what we could do, guys. Let's take all this red bean paste and just throw it in the dirt outside leftover town. We can watch the poor pieces of crap of the country, like literally sift through the dirt trying to eat it. <laughs> so they're making fun of like those people, of the people of Wano and stuff. And Luffy flashes back to Tama and Tama when the first time she had the red bean paste, which was the red bean soup, which once again is not like, it's not really frou-frou or anything. It's not like a delicacy. It's just, it's red bean soup. It's just a really basic dish. It's like a sweet, it's a confectionery. But even so, Tama's used to eating like millet. So like to her, that was like, you know, oh my God, this is the most amazing thing I ever ate. This is the happiest day ever. This would be like the equivalent of a kid not having much to eat. And then for their, uh, for their birthday, you just like, like go into the freaking gas station and buy them a fudge round or like a zebra cake or what other kind of, uh, you know, little, little pastry cake you could buy at a gas station wherever you live in the world. Um, my favorite are fudge rounds. Those things are delicious. But that's like if you went into the gas station and like, you know, you know, you know, 50 cents, here's a fudge round and give it to the kid. Here you go, kid. Happy birthday. And the kid's like, oh my God, this is the most delicious thing I've ever had in my life. Oh my God. So that's the way they're treating this Oshiruko, but then Luffy's having none of that, because Luffy's like, oh, how dare they? They're making fun. They're wasting all this food. This food could be going to the people at Oshiruko. They're knocking it over like, I don't want this food. Luffy gets pissed, and then that's the end of the chapter. Luffy gets pissed, end of chapter. Uh, and break next week, unfortunately. So sorry about that, but hey, what are you gonna do? Um, Shonen Jump's not on a break next week. It's just One Piece happens to be on a break next week. So, yeah, that's the chapter, though, and um, pretty solid one. A lot of stuff going on here, setting up, you know, what the Straw Hats are all doing, breaking up into their individual teams. We didn't really see what's happening with Zoro, so he's just getting lost somewhere in the compound. But, yeah, Luffy already made it here. And uh, I also love how Luffy's like, man, you, you know, Kid, he doesn't know anything about Odin or his struggle. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. Uh, Kid was not present when they went over that whole backstory and everything. Kid has no idea about the backstory of Wano or Ever. He doesn't need to. He's just like, I'm going to kick the crap out of Orochi for ruining, you know, kid's life. I mean, killer's life. A, a kid and killer. I always confuse them because they're both K words. But, but then, then I'm going to beat the crap out of Kaido. Kaido, killer, kid. Yep, there you go. And so he's somewhere else in the compound. We don't even know where kid and killer are at. We haven't seen him. But Luffy's already in the main hall. So everybody's kind of toasty at this point. So nobody's really wrecking. Like, that's Straw Hat Luffy over there. Dude, you're drunk. Yeah, I am. But that is Straw Hat Luffy over there. You know, yeah, okay. And he just passes out through a table, you know, right? So anyway. Um, but yeah, I have no idea what's going to be going on with Yamato. At this point, I'm a little bit more on the cusp of, like, him being alive. Because, you know, like... The Toby Ropo, they weren't very specific, but they didn't seem shocked or anything. They were like, I want you to find my son. Like, if they knew Yamato was dead, they probably would just be like, Oh... Your son. Yeah, find him. Uh, okay, Master Kaido. We'll get right on that. They seemed like, like, they was like, hmm, that'll be a very difficult task. Hmm, but it could be done. It, it seemed like Sasaki and Who's Who, they were also really excited. They were like, oh yeah, we could do this. If Sasaki and Who's Who knew that Kaido's son was dead and this was like an impossible task, they wouldn't be getting this excited. Like, like Who's Who, is because he's, he's smirking. He's like, oh yeah, yeah, find his son, and then we can fight them, and I can be the Calamity. So... I'm assuming Yamato at this point is alive. It's just trying to find him might be difficult. Maybe he has a devil fruit that makes it really good for him to hide. Maybe he can escape observation hockey. Maybe he's not on Onigashima. Maybe he went somewhere else. Uh, maybe he can transform into some kind of animal or something so he could hide better or some kind of chameleon fruit or something like that. It, it, the the, the, the Toby Ropa are saying, man, that is not an easy task to find him. So there's got to be some reason why they can't just like observation, find him or do whatever. So there's got to be something for reason why they can't find him or he's just a really, really strong character. Maybe they, you know, just try to bring him in and he just fights back and he's too strong. Um, so there's reasons for that. That, but who's who seems excited so who's who thinks that like this can be done this is gonna be hard but if I'm the one that can pull it off we'll be good he seems like he could actually he, he has confidence that he could do this so I'm, I'm not thinking Yamato is dead but we're just gonna have to find out later and see what happens from there I'm also interested in the festival activities and seeing what the special announcement is what is the special announcement let me know below what you think about that I mean it's something that's gonna be really complicated probably something that Kaido wouldn't normally say it might be you know what immediately I thought of is this 
maybe Kaido is going to sever connections with Orochi here. Uh, maybe he might be like, hey, I already have, you know, this is the moment. You know, Whitebeard's dead. I'm joining an alliance with, you know, Big Mom. Um, if there was ever going to be a moment where we we're going to pull all of our resources together and just make a break for Raftail, Raftal or Laftail to, to find the One Piece, this would be it. Or if there, or if there was ever going to be a moment to fight the Marines as an organization, it would be right now. Like, strike while the iron is hot. So the announcement might be like, you know, all right, everyone, I know we're having a good festival time. I know we all have been uh, having a blast on Wano these last 20 years, but now, tell you what, me and Lin, Lin we're forming an alliance. Two Yonko, working together. Look, look, look. We're taking on Marine HQ. That's right, Marine Ford 2.0, and we're gonna stomp him into the ground. Yeah, no Shanks ain't gonna stop us now. Glug glug glug. And um, they might be something like that. We're gonna attack Marijua. We're gonna attack Marine HQ. We're gonna go for Laugh Tail. We're just gonna finally make the break for it. We're gonna finally do this. We're gonna leave our respective lands, and we're just gonna start terrorizing the globe as active pirate crews. We're not just—they're already active, but we're not just gonna stay on Wano, stay on Totland. No, we're just gonna start stamping out a path of destruction in the New World. That's what we're. We're doing now and the reason why he doesn't want to just like you know you, you don't you don't put that on the damn schedule like all right there's going to be a toast by the calamities and fuku rokuju uh, and then big mom's going to arrive and uh, with her children we're going to have a nice little meeting there that'll be nice and then kaido announces that he's going to declare war on the entire world government Sir Kaido, I have some questions. You know, like, uh, no, you're gonna, yeah, yeah. So it's best to, like, do it when everybody's riled up and like, yeah, let's do this! Hell yeah! Pirates rule the world! We can finally do this! Hell yeah! So, yeah, and I mean, given how the Marines were acting, you know, when the announcement was made that their alliance is forming, they seemed like, like, Garp and Sengoku, they seemed pretty troubled by that. Like, this, this could actually destroy the world if they work together in perfect tandem, um, in unity. Yeah, this, this could happen. So, I think the alliance is going to break down at some point. I still believe that. But for right now, I mean, right, like I said, strike while the iron is hot. But anyway, uh, that was the video. Thanks for watching, everybody. This will be Techie 101 signing out. A lot of big things coming. We just have to wait a while. See you, everyone.